some have spoken of the American century. I say that the century on which we are entering can be and must be the century of the common man. A radical redistribution of economic power. I mean, we know that racism is just is, is a byproduct of capitalism. Everything would be all right if everything was put back in the hands of the people. We need a government that will make sure Americans are taken care of and organize the economy to serve the people, not the profits of a wealthy few. We now have the techniques and the resources to get rid of poverty. We got to start getting out there with the people. Get out of the movement and get to the masses. We need a government of action. Even in Karl Marx's lifetime, capitalism was changing. Karl Marx wrote about capitalism in the industrial stage. He wrote about factory owners and factory workers and the contradiction between them and the selling of products. But even in Karl Marx's lifetime, there was a change taking place in the capitalist system. In 1851, the same year as, as Louis Bonaparte's coup, uh, there was a pamphlet published in the United States, an anti-slavery pamphlet, but written by Henry Carey. And Henry Carey, Karl Marx said he is the only American economist of any importance. And the final paragraphs of that pamphlet I will read here. Henry Carey wrote in 1851, two systems are before the world. One looks at exporting men to occupy desert tracts, the sovereignty of which is obtained by aid of diplomacy or war, the other to increasing the value of an immense extent of vacant land by importing men by the millions for their occupation. One looks to the centralization of wealth and power in a great commercial city that shall rival the great cities of modern times, which have been and are supported by the aid of contributions which have exhausted every nation subjected to them. And the other to concentration, by aid of which a market shall be made upon the land for the products of the land, and the farmer and the planter to be enriched. One looks to increasing the necessity of commerce, the other to increasing the power to maintain it. One looks to overworking the Hindu and sinking the rest of the world to his level. The other to raising the standards of man throughout the world to our level. One looks to pauperism, ignorance, depopulation, and barbarism. The other to increasing wealth, comfort, intelligence, combination of action, and civilization. One looks toward universal war. The other toward universal peace. One is the English system, the other we may be proud to call the American system, for it is the one ever devised the tendency of which was elevating while equalizing the conditions of man throughout the world. And what Henry Carey was referring to was the fact that the way Britain was securing its place in the world economy was by holding back economic development. And that did not fit exactly with Marx's understanding. Marx thought that Britain colonizing India was a good thing because it would bring the free market. But as Henry Carey observed, Britain was not industrializing or making India wealthier. He did not think the British were going to India and making people wealthier. Um, and that Britain was securing its place on the world market by holding back economic development. And then, in later years of Marx's life, Marx becomes an enthusiastic supporter of the Irish people and their struggle for national liberation. Marx, this is what he writes about the Irish liberation struggle. He says, Ireland is the bulwark of the English landed aristocracy. The exploitation of that country is not only one of the main sources of their material wealth, it is their greatest moral strength. They, in fact, represent the domination over Ireland. Ireland is therefore the cardinal means by which the English aristocracy maintain their domination over England itself. Thus, to hasten social revolution in England, is the most important object of the International Working Men's Association. The sole means of doing so is to make Ireland independent. It is therefore the task of the International to bring the conflict between England and Ireland to the forefront everywhere and to side with Ireland publicly everywhere. The special task of the Central Council in London is to awaken the consciousness of the English working class that, for them, the national emancipation of Ireland is not a question of abstract justice or humanitarian sentiment, but the first condition for their own emancipation. That's Karl Marx saying that, yeah, please. 
That's Karl Marx saying that for the English workers to be free, they have to fight for the Irish to be free. And that, that the British, you know, English capitalist system maintained itself by exploiting the Irish people. Marx had opposed all nationalism and said all nationalism is inherently reactionary. It's workers and bosses. There are no countries. Workers of the world unite. But in the final years of his life, he's saying that the Irish fight for national liberation, which was largely waged on a nationalist and in some cases a religious basis, was a good thing because it would lead to dismantling English capitalism. And so then, a few years after Karl Marx died, Cecil Rhodes, do people know the name Cecil Rhodes? Oh, yes. Yeah, Rhodesia, right? Oh. Which now is now Zimbabwe, it was a settler colonial state that Cecil Rhodes created. In addition to that, there's the Rhodes Scholar Program. Oh, yeah, you know, it's Bill Clinton and some of the great intellectuals of American capitalism. Cecil Rhodes, the colonizer of Africa, who's responsible for the death of millions of Africans, a brutal, racist, uh, he apparently told this to a journalist. And this is a, an account of something that he said to a journalist, which Lenin quotes. He says, I was in the East End of London, a working class quarter, yesterday, and I attended a meeting of the unemployed and I listened to their wild speeches, which were just a cry for bread, bread. And on my way home, I pondered over the scene and became more than ever convinced of the importance of imperialism. My cherished idea is a solution for the social problem. In order to save the 40 million inhabitants of the United Kingdom from a bloody civil war, we colonial statesmen must acquire new lands to settle the surplus population to provide new markets for the goods produced in the factories and mines. The empire, as I have always said, is a bread and butter question. If you want to avoid a civil war, you must become imperialists. And what he was saying was that as the working people of Britain were becoming unemployed and hungry, as Britain was having economic crises due to the falling rate of profit, that in order to resolve this contradiction, they needed to create an empire and they needed to export unemployed workers as settlers to developing countries. And they needed to dump their products on the developing countries and force these developing countries to buy their products in order to deal with the problem of overproduction. And that imperialism was a way of holding back the class struggle, right? By, by getting the working people of Britain to see themselves as members of the British Empire, exploiting and oppressing people in other countries, that they would not see themselves as workers rising up against capitalism. Well, all of these trends are what Lenin ultimately described in his book, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. Capitalism in our time is not pencil factories and pencil workers. <laughs> Capitalism in our time is imperialism. It is the rule of the world by big cartels and trusts and syndicates and monopolies based in Western countries. And big corporations and banks in the United States and Britain and France and Germany dominate the world. And in order to stay at the center of the world, they must keep the world poor. When countries emerge from poverty, uh, that gets in their way. That, that cuts into their monopoly. They must keep the world poor in order for themselves to stay rich. That is imperialism. And that's what imperialism really means. Imperialism, imperialism may manifest itself in, in cultural trends or, or, or such, but at the end of the day, imperialism is an economic question. It's about keeping the world poor. It's about holding back economic development. You can talk about various examples that are blatant. You know, when the British Empire went to India, you know, the people of India had been weaving for thousands of years. You can talk about in Bangladesh, Sonar Bengal, you know, some of the, the finest silk and such. They burned down all the textile mills and they forced them to import all their cloth from Britain. You know, Mahatma Gandhi, what was he, what was he famous for? Well, he boiled his own salt because the people of India were forced to import their salt from Britain. So he got seawater and he boiled it and they arrested him for it because he was cutting into the monopoly. Um, there's other examples of this. The Opium Wars in 1839 and 1856, uh, because China wanted to block the importation of, of British products and keep their own economy going, the British sent their military on two different occasions to force, to force China to import British products, one of which was opium, uh, the, the narcotic. And the Opium Wars were mainly fought to force China to accept products uh, from Britain and allow their own industries to be put out of business. And as a result of, of those opium wars and the destruction of China's economy and preventing China from growing, probably between 100 and 200 million people died. 
You know, we're always given this big number about communism. No one talks about how many millions of people died because Western capitalism, Adam Smith, free market ideologies, was forced on people at the barrel of a gun. Countries were kept chronically poor. The way we're taught to think about the world is that some countries are just naturally poor and some countries are just naturally rich. And that's just the way the world is. And that is not the truth, that there is a global system intact to keep some countries poor and to maintain the wealth of some other countries. And that is imperialism. A much more recent example is NAFTA, right? the North American Free Trade Agreement. Mexico used to have a lot of farmers. There used to be a lot of farmers in Mexico who grew their products, sold them. Well, NAFTA allowed the United States to send agricultural products to Mexico and put all the Mexican farmers out of business to, to have them at a lower price with, with subsidies. Now Mexican farmers are out of business. The same thing happened in Haiti. In Haiti, uh, it was a very similar situation where you know, American agricultural agribusiness put them out of business, right? And that's an example of this. It's only because of imperialism that Nigeria can be the top oil exporting country in Africa. There's not one African country that has more oil exported than Nigeria, um, but it only has a life expectancy of 60 years, and only 62% of the population can read and write, right? Crime. Yeah, absolutely. Crime. Yeah, but this is imperialism. But another aspect of imperialism was the creation of an aristocracy of labor, right? We talked about all those workers that were fighting for bread, bread, bread. Well, in order to stop the class struggle and in order to, in order to stabilize the imperialist homelands where workers were fighting for rights, as the capitalists were expanding all over the world and making super profits all over the world, they could afford to buy off sections of the working class at home. And they could afford to stratify the working class, right, and give some workers better pay than others. And as some workers, the quote unquote skilled workers, as they saw their standard of living go up, they began to sympathize with the imperialists. They began to support the wars. And on top of that, they began to be hostile to the other workers. They would think, I'm better, you know, I get better pay, I'm a skilled worker, you're an unskilled worker. And by stratifying the working class and dividing the working class, they could hold off class struggle. And that was the concept of the aristocracy of labor, dividing the working class at home. Now, those workers that got a better pay, got better pay, they were still exploited. They were still not being paid the full value of their labor. But because they got a little something, they thought they were better. And I mean, we, we see this kind of phenomenon probably in workplaces. I don't know, people have probably seen, you know, the boss starts treating one worker better and they think, well, I'm better than, every, you, know, you know, and they start to sympathize against the other workers. This happens, right? This is a tendency. Well, this was happening on a global scale. And, uh, and the workers that were higher paid and skilled in the homeland began to sympathize with their bosses against the lower paid workers at home and against the people in the developing world. And their unions became less revolutionary. Unions were started by the socialist movement. But as these skilled trades, uh, their, their unions became more and more conservative and more, more supporting of the war. And that is the concept of the aristocracy of labor. And that is why, Lenin argued, that the revolutionary energy would come from the East and from the developing world, from the countries that were kept chronically poor by imperialism. It wouldn't come from the West. There wouldn't be a revolution in the United States. There wouldn't be a revolution in Britain. There was going to be a revolution in the developing countries where whole nations were kept poor. And it would be on the basis of national liberation that this would take place. And as imperialism was in ascendancy, and as the imperialist system was, was expanding, there was at that point a, a situation that we refer to as the crisis of Marxism. Because at that point, what Marx had predicted was not coming true, right? The, he had predicted that, the, that the, the problems that we had just laid out would lead to the workers of Europe rising up and seizing their factories. And that wasn't happening. So in response to the crisis of Marxism, we got three different responses. We have Edward Bernstein. Folks know Edward Bernstein. Uh, yeah. Yes, Edward Bernstein was the revisionist. And that's actually what he called himself. That wasn't a slur. He said that he was a revisionist. He said, I am a revisionist. And he said, the movement is everything. The goal is nothing. Meaning it's not really about workers actually rising up and seizing power. It's about the day-to-day -day struggle for reform. He said that revolution is simply the sum of reforms. There's not a revolution that happens. He says capitalism just kind of naturally sort of turns into socialism. 
you know, that one step at a time. And he said, look, in, in, in Germany, we have universal male suffrage. Every man can vote. And there's, there's more workers than there are capitalists. It's like we have dictatorship of the proletariat already. We have the vote. He was also a social imperialist. He argued that when the Western countries were colonizing developing countries, that was good because it was helping them to become further along and that the West was further along in the road to socialism. We have public education. We have universal male suffrage. Look, we even have a 12-hour workday in some countries. We're, we're speeding along towards socialism one step at a time, reformism. That's Edward Bernstein. And Edward Bernstein's ideas gradually became more or less the outlook of the aristocracy of labor and the, the conservative leadership of the labor unions, et cetera. So that's Edward Bernstein. That's one response. So then you have this guy. If you folks know who this guy is. So that's George Sorrell. Folks know about George Sorrell. So George Sorrell, he's a French syndicalist, meaning that he did not believe in, in voting or, or forming political parties. It was all about the struggle of the worker on the job, right? That politics is a waste of time. We don't form political parties. It's just about unions fighting capitalists. And George Sorrell argues that the problem the Marxist movement is having is, is a spiritual or psychological problem. He says that revolutions aren't made by the broad masses of people. And the mistake that the Marxist movement is making is it's trying to organize all of society. And at, at the time in Europe, that was true. There were huge Marxist parties. There were Marxist marching bands and Marxist choirs. There were labor unions led by Marxists. There were unemployed associations. And he's saying that's the mistake. The revolutions aren't made by the broad masses of people. They're instead made by an elite group of men who he says become heroic by using violence. And he also argues that mythology is good, right? That, that the idea that there is truth is not, not necessary, and that mythology, legends, falsehoods, are what motivate people to do things. And that socialists and revolutionaries should start adopting mythological beliefs and build isolated groups of men who act and become very heroic and violent in order to achieve the socialist revolution. Um, now, interestingly, George Sorrell and his, his followers eventually laid the basis for Benito Mussolini uh, and fascism, as well as the, the basis for, uh, for Franco in Spain, uh, the national syndicalists, they were called. And they ultimately dropped the Marxian belief in historical progress, and they started romanticizing the past. Uh, many of them became supporters of the monarchy. George Sorrell was actually a member of a monarchist party because he argued that the myth of the monarchy could be used to overcome capitalism. So that's George Sorrell. But we also know... I'm sure we all know who this guy is. This guy. <laughs> this guy said that capitalism is becoming imperialism and that the revolutionary energy would be in the East. Put him at the top here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's much better, don't we think? Yeah. He said the revolutionary energy is coming from the East and that in Russia they needed a party of new type, a vanguard party that would organize to bank revolution. And this party would engage in democratic centralism, meaning that all the revolutionaries would be in one group, but they would vote and they would make a decision. And when they made a decision, all the members would carry it out. And he formed a central committee. He went to all the well-known revolutionary organizers and activists in Russia. They had a meeting in 1903 in London. And he formed his central committee for the party of new type. And because the majority of the people in the room agreed to form his party of new type, they were called the Bolsheviks, or the majority. And those who didn't want to join the party of new type were called the Mensheviks, or the minority. And the party of new type engaged in agitation and propaganda. What is agitation and propaganda? So agitation was stirring up to create a great confrontation. Uh, you know, when stirring up, you know, workers, your pay isn't high enough, your boss is ripping you off, agitation, right? Uh, the landlords are exploiting the peasants, stirring up to revolt and protest, agitation. Agitation is very simple. It's very to the point. It's just pointing out an injustice, stirring people up to create a confrontation. That's agitation. But propaganda is different. Propaganda is teaching people Marxism, right? It's, it's educating people about the Marxist ideology and teaching people and helping people to become scientific communists. So the idea of the party of new type was the party of new type would agitate to the masses, but propagate to the advanced. So while you're agitating to the masses, you would find the best and the brightest and propagate to them and make them communists. And that this was the approach for the party of new type. Um, and that was Lenin's theory of the party of new type. And Lenin argued that 
like Marx, realized that you had to support national liberation of people that are oppressed in the developing world. And Lenin built this organization, the Bolsheviks, as a party of new type, as a revolutionary party. And the culmination of the crisis of Marxism was ultimately World War I. Before World War I, all the major socialist groups in Europe had agreed, and they promised they would never support a capitalist war. Never would they support a capitalist war. It would never happen. But then, when World War I started, they all sold out. The British socialists sold out, the German socialists sold out, the Mensheviks in Russia sold out. They all sold out and they supported the war. But the Bolsheviks didn't support the war. They refused to support the war. Like Eugene Debs in the United States who went to prison, they didn't support World War I. And they said that you know, they would never support workers being sent to kill other workers in a war for capitalist and imperialist profits. Right. And as that happened, as, as World War I took place, there became a crisis in Russian society because of the fact that the Tsar was viewed as incompetent and losing the war, because they had you know, a very a medieval autocratic government system. There was a crisis in Russia during the war, and during that crisis uh, you had the February Revolution, where the workers of Russia rose up and toppled the Tsar. And the February Revolution was supported by even the majority of capitalists in Russia at the time because the Tsar's government was considered to be incompetent. It was considered to, to be failing. And the February Revolution resulted in the provisional government of Alexander Kerensky being created. But the question in Russia after, after the toppling of the Tsar in February of 1917, the question was, would they continue the war or not? Alexander Kerensky was continuing the war, uh, but there were millions of people in Russia who did not want to keep fighting in World War I. And so the Bolsheviks became the party that was opposed to fighting in the war. They wanted to end the war, right? The demand was peace, land, and bread, but peace was primary. And that's what separated them from every other political tendency. There was no other political tendency that was anywhere as big as they were that wanted an immediate end to the war. The Bolsheviks were against the war. And the way people understood it was there are some people that are for the war, and then there's the Bolsheviks who are against the war. So the Bolsheviks throughout July of 1917 into the summer are leading strikes all through Russia, down with war, ending the war, wanting to withdraw Russia from the war. And there's chaos and there's protests going on. So a leader of the military named Kornilov decides that he is going to become the military dictator and he's going to crush the strikes and protests. So Kornilov takes his army from the front of World War I and starts marching it back towards St. Petersburg, where he's going to become the dictator and he's going to crush all the unrest taking place in Russia. And of course, the provisional government of Alexander Kerensky is terrified because they're all going to be shot and it's going to become a military dictatorship. And the Bolsheviks have this huge organization. So the Bolsheviks organize the defense of St. Petersburg from the Kornilov reactions. As Kornilov's army is marching towards St. Petersburg, the Bolsheviks are building barricades. And the provisional government uh, starts opening up the armories and giving guns and weapons to the Bolsheviks. And pretty soon the Bolsheviks' army is bigger than the actual Russian Revolutionary Army. And they're fortifying the city to fight off the Kornilov reaction. And then, uh, as word of how well fortified St. Petersburg is and how ready they are to defend the city from Kornilov's attack, Kornilov's soldiers start deserting and they start turning around. And pretty soon Kornilov's, uh, Kornilov's army is not coming anymore. And the Kornilov reaction is defeated in September. And so at that point, the Bolsheviks say, you know, we've got this whole apparatus of workers' councils and Soviets. We're going to declare the Soviets to be the new government. We're going to create a Soviet government. So in October of 1917, that is the first socialist state that was created. That's how the Russian Revolution happened. So I think that's our, our second class. So let's discuss. Go ahead. Etc. Lenin praises Debs excessively in his writings. There's a very good volume called Lenin on the United States, and it has everything Lenin wrote from his complete works on the United States, and there's excessive praise for Debs. Um, and he talks about how uh, when Teddy Roosevelt ran for president in 1912, Lenin talks about how Teddy Roosevelt was basically put into the election to take votes away from Debs, and that Teddy Roosevelt was a racist and an imperialist, but he also had this, this you know, workers' rights kind of stuff in his platform. And Lenin talk, you know, paralleled Teddy Roosevelt's campaign in 1912 to take votes away from Debs 
uh, you know, he, he paralleled that to the social democrats in Europe and how they were, you know, it was like fake socialism to serve empire. Uh, Lenin loved Eugene Debs. And if you read his letter to the American workers, which is in your handbook, he praises Debs excessively. And Eugene Debs was, I mean, he was, he was a populist and he was a household name. He got almost a million votes when he ran for president. He was well loved and thrown in prison for opposing the war. A great American hero if there ever was one. But did, did Debs ever have, have any public views on Lenin? No. no. Um, no, I don't think so. I don't think they interacted. Who's the next person? Uh, Debs did at one point say he was a Bolshevik, so. Oh. <laughs> so um, I, I was listening to Vijay Prashad, who is an Indian communist, and he said that <clears throat> it's been estimated that $42 trillion um, were taken out of India by the British um, colonialists. And so that was, for me, that was just staggering. Um, and that obviously has continued under imperialism. Um, it's, it's important, you know, just thought to note that. Yeah, yeah. 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 So true. Yeah. Absolutely. So many countries. I mean, we, we're taught that some countries are just naturally wealthy exactly. and some are not. You know, I, I, when I was uh, a child, I was 12 years old, I went to Quito, Ecuador in the middle of their financial crisis. And I, I had never seen that level of poverty before. And um, there, was, there was a member of my family I was talking to about it. And they said, well, the reason people in Ecuador are so poor right now is because in the United States, when you start a business meeting, it starts on time. But in Ecuador, they, they take a half hour to start their meetings. They're just not so efficient. And, and, and you know, these are the kind of things that people believe. But if you look at what was actually happening in Ecuador when I was 12 years old, it was that the USA had forced them to adopt the dollar and give up their own currency. It was that the Asian markets had collapsed. It was because of uh, there was an agricultural crisis of El Nino. And actually, when I was there in 1999, there were hundreds of thousands of people uh, were either fleeing the country or dying uh, because of this economic crisis created by imperialism. And that was happening all over Latin America in the 1990s. Neoliberalism, they were going for the kill. And there was just, they were in country after country, they were creating a man-made famine. And I mean, why do we think all these people are coming up on the border? You know, I mean, this is created by capitalism. Um, and, and that is what we need to communicate to people because people aren't aware. Again, they want to give us a body count, but they, you know, look at the body count created by their system. Look at all that wealth exploited from India, right? I mean, I mean, you know, you talk about a country that, you know, with vast civilization, so much resources, so much wealth, but yet kept in chronic poverty so these huge multinational corporations can stay rich. That's the nature of imperialism, and it's about holding back development. And this is the confusion. A lot of people think that, that imperialism does bring development, and that's a big confusion in our movement. A lot of people think that, that imperialism is about development. I've heard this so often. People will say things like, well, you know, imperialism, they, they, they're thinking about Avatar, right? You ever see the movie Avatar? They think it's Avatar. They think, oh, they're these beautiful, primitive people, and we come there with our cell phones and our McDonald's, and we take away their beautiful, primitive ways. That's not what imperialism is, right? You can talk about cultural hegemony and how some religions are suppressed and people's traditions and stuff, but at the end of the day, imperialism is an economic relationship, and it's about keeping countries poor, and in a lot of cases, that means keeping intact, you know, uh, uh, you know, feudal and authoritarian traditional practices. The British reinforced the caste system in India. They didn't impose their Western enlightened ways. No, they reinforced the caste system. Right now in the Middle East, uh, the U.S. imperialists are supporting the Wahhabis in Saudi Arabia and, and Wahhabi terrorism, right? It's not, it's not a question of they're, they're trying to impose the Western ways on the beautiful Islamic. No, it's the opposite. They're supporting the most reactionary, barbaric forces in Saudi Arabia. And that this is what is missing, this understanding, and that, that you know, a lot of the way this kind of stuff is taught in the universities, when they talk about cultural imperialism, what this is really about is this is your sensitivity training. This started at Harvard and Yale and all of that. And in order to get countries to trade with the United States, in order to get countries to sign contracts with ExxonMobil and BP, they are teaching us how to be more sensitive and not be, you know, white assholes who go there and, and, and talk like jerks, but they don't talk about the economics of imperialism. Because at the end of the day, imperialism is about economics. And in a lot of cases, we see, you know, the most primitive and backward forces being supported, like the Dalai Lama, for example, in Tibet. That is reaction. That is reaction, right? And, and, and you know, the people of Tibet are very happy that railroads are being built and that, 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 that poverty is being alleviated, right? But the West, you know, they've created this mythology that, you know, the feudal kingdom uh, was just so beautiful uh, before, before the Chinese communists came there. Go ahead. Yeah, um, uh, I hear a lot of people calling uh, China today, you know, as a social imperialist because they do uh, uh, business trades. Um, but, but the way to dispel that is that it's actually more of a win-win a, a cooperation and, uh, and when they uh, when they help out other countries economically, they expect nothing in return other than you know a mutual trade off, 
And um, what, was, what would also be your advice on uh, how to dispel the myth that China is social imperialist? Okay. Um, and if someone could get me another bottle of water because my throat is, yeah, that'd be great. Um, but, um, well, first of all, I don't think they get nothing in return. They do get plenty in return, right? Um, but if you look at the way China trades with countries, right, they go there and they, they sponsor the country, they build a railroad, they build a hospital, they build infrastructure that lays the basis for the domestic economy of the country to expand. And then as the domestic economy of the country expands, those domestic businesses that start up, because you now have more access to roads or access to railway, thank you very much, um, because of that, then there's more for China to trade with in that country. And they, instead of holding back development in countries in Africa or in Asia or in Latin America that they do business with, they're doing the opposite. They're enabling development. If you go to Brazil, there's hydroelectrical power plants all over Brazil, and they've electrified huge amounts of it. It was Chinese corporations that built that. Right? When, the, when the imperialists go to a country, they destroy the hydroelectrical power plants. They destroy development. They hold back development. China goes to countries, and it builds railroads, and it builds hydropower plants, and it builds, it builds up and strengthens the domestic economy so that China can do business. But it's not purely selfless, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't, we shouldn't try to pretend it is. You know, Chinese corporations make lots of money, and there are many examples of Chinese corporations doing unethical things. Let's, let's be real about that. Let's not pretend that, that Chinese corporations don't do bad things, right? But at the end of the day, it's not imperialism, because imperialism is about a relationship, about holding back economic development. That's the basis of imperialism. It's, it's an economic relationship. And China's relationship and what it's doing with the Belt and Road simply does not constitute imperialism. The same for the Eurasian Economic Union from Russia. You know, uh, a lot of people, you know, when they saw that the Russian state-run oil companies, for example, Gazprom and Rosneft, were doing business in Syria, they said, oh, this is imperialism. Well, no, it's not. Syria has state-run oil and gas companies. Russia has state-run oil and gas companies. And so the two of them are having joint ventures. And Syria's state-run gas companies are getting bigger because Russian engineers and all of them are, are doing business and they have a relationship. That's not imperialism, right? Imperialism is about holding back development. So that's the difference. Another point? Um, hi, Caleb. Um, my question is about just the labor aristocracy. Um, obviously, Lenin mentions that revolution is more likely to come from the East. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak to certain folks, namely like uh, Maoist third, third worldist types, that take that concept, you know, the stratification of labor within the imperialist core, to say that there is no, like that the la that the working class in uh, the core has no revolutionary potential. I was just wondering if you could speak to that a little. Sure. Bit. Well, look. Labor aristocracy, you know, Lenin was long dead in 1950, but after World War II, what, what you can call the labor aristocracy of the United States vastly expanded. And let's be important, when you say the term labor aristocracy, what do most people think? They think you mean union bosses. That's not what the term means. That would be the labor bureaucracy. Labor aristocracy refers to actual workers whose pay is high enough that it changes their consciousness. And in the 1950s in the United States, there was a huge expansion. I mean, you know, labor aristocracy used to only be like, you know, construction and skilled trades, they called it. But you had a lot of steel workers. You had a lot of auto workers who were making enough pay. that They were very conservative, and they supported the Korean War, and they were racist, and they didn't want black people moving into their neighborhoods. And they were, they were reactionary on the basis of, of their rising living standard. And they said, look, this is the American way. I support the empire. Um, and that was the aristocracy of labor. Um, and it was a huge expansion of it. And that has been a big impediment to revolutionary organizing in the United States. Anyone who has done revolutionary organizing in the United States has said that's a problem, that there are a lot of working people in the United States who are convinced that capitalism is great, uh, that communism is pure evil, that the reason we have a higher living standard is because of, uh, of, of our capitalist system and we should support it around the world. That's a big problem. But what we're seeing now is the destruction of the labor aristocracy. Yeah, in the neoliberal era, they're getting rid of the aristocracy of labor. So to go around now and say, oh, it's impossible, we can't do anything, it, no, the, things are opening up. And this has affected the consciousness. Because the aristocracy of labor has been broken down, because those factories have closed down, because those wages have gone away, suddenly there's more consciousness around the police state than ever before, right? I mean, you know, I mean, there's more consciousness, there's more anti-war sentiment among working people than ever before. And right now, the, ba the possibility of solidarity and, and breaking down the problem of labor aristocracy is bigger than before. And that's why the imperialists are pushing the toxicity of identity politics, because they want to make sure that doesn't happen. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in the next class, and especially this afternoon. But that's why they are trying to prevent this. What the Communist Party did in the 1930s, black and white, unite and fight, putting the needs of the oppressed first to liberate the whole working class, this is the time for that message. 
And that is why there is so much of an effort to try and keep that message from coming. Because in the 1970s, there were a lot of people in the new communist movement who got jobs in factories. And I've talked to a lot of these folks, you know, and they can tell you about it. You know, they, they came out of the 1960s, they'd marched for civil rights, they'd marched, uh, you know, against the Vietnam War, they joined a communist group, and they got a job in a steel mill or a textile mill or a factory or whatever, and they tried to win their coworkers to communism. And in a lot of cases, their workers told them to go screw themselves. And they said, get away from me. You're going to go away. You know, I love my country. America, right or wrong, love it or leave it. Now, there are some exceptions. In Detroit, for example, the new communist movement was very successful. Uh, you had the forming of DRUM, for example. DRUM was created, uh, the Dodge Revolutionary Union movement. Uh, in Atlanta, there were some successes. So it wasn't a complete failure. But for the most part, the bulk of the American working class was, was in the 70s, even though things were starting to go downhill, still had high enough of a, a standard of living that you had you had at that point you know, some reaction. And then finally, 1979, uh, you have you know, a, a, an economic downturn, the first major economic downturn. And a lot of these communist groups said, finally, now the workers are ready to fight. And 1979, you see a lot of communist groups doing some crazy stuff, because they said, it's now or never. Right? You have you know, the Greensboro, North Carolina. You had the Communist Workers Party challenging the Ku Klux Klan to a shootout. <laughs> and look how that turned out. Uh, you know? You had the, the RCP doing some crazy stuff, 1979, because the leftist groups are saying there's finally an economic downturn. We've been working in these factories for, for a whole decade, and finally things are getting bad, and it's going to happen. But that's not what happened. Right? In 1979, we had the rise of you know, ultimately Reagan, because things had been rising since World War II. Right? And so about 1979, 1980, 1981, you have what I refer to as the Great Retreat, which is the, the, the communists in the United States have found all these safe spaces to go to. And they've decided that, you know what, the broad masses of Americans aren't ready to hear communism. You know, we tried it for a decade. We did what you're supposed to do. We moved into working class neighborhoods. We sold, com and they didn't want to hear it. So it can't be done. Well, the thing is, now it can be done. Conditions have changed. Yeah, you're right. Back then it couldn't be done because there was the labor aristocracy was so big. But it's been decade after decade and, de and decade of cutbacks and trade agreements. And now we have a situation where the majority of working people are anti-war, they're anti-government, and they're ready to hear this. And it's time to now get out of the movement and to the masses. Out of the movement. 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 To the masses. The, the time is here. Now is not the time to talk about labor aristocracy. Now is not the time to say, oh, all American workers are a bunch of reactionary pigs. I'm just going to sit on my computer and type about Maoist third worldism. <laughs> now is not the time to do it. Out of the movement. To the masses. Out of the movement. To the masses. Oh, go, go ahead, Dust. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we want other people to speak. Yeah. Comrade Palo. Oh, I think yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. Uh, maybe. Um, so I know I'm in the right room right now, um, yeah. Center for Political Innovation, because <clears throat> the very second presentation I see is about anti-imperialism. And a lot of groups will, will only recognize and organize around that very first, um, that very first presentation um, about the contradiction between the work, uh, the worker, and the capitalist. Um, and they'll focus on that, or maybe they'll talk about wars and empires or oppression of black and brown brothers and sisters as if it's, you know, a separate or additional issue. But no, the entire global political economic system is imperialism. That's right. That's right. And I mean, if you, re if you read Comrade Stalin, um, there's three main contradictions. Um, the pr the the oppression of oppressed nations, oppressor nations, and oppressed nations, the worker and the capitalist, and also the fight amongst the imperialists. But these are, you know, these are the main contradictions um, today. It's not another issue. It's not foreign policy. It is imperialism. When they attack us um, here in, in the United States, uh, when they shoot down black and, br black, black and brown brothers and sisters in the street, um, and ex super exploit them by keeping them in, na in neighborhoods with less resources, by giving them less job opportunities. That is an oppressed nation. That is super, a super exploitation of people right in here amongst us. Um, and they do this. That is how, this is the imperial core. So they use this super, ex this is what Marx talked about, um, what, what Marx talked about at the very ending um, is of his career, which Lenin, you know, really formalized, is every dollar they, they take away from oppressed people, 
Um, really, t- you want to talk about China? They always want to blame Chinese workers um, for <clears throat> for oh, all the moves, all the jobs moved to China. Let's blame Chinese workers. Well, who, why were Chinese workers willing to move? Um, out of the the countryside and into the cities to be able to pay such low wages. It's because imperialism, uh, the British and the U.S., kept them in absolute poverty for hundreds and hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. So the the Chinese Communist Party um, and Deng and others who used, you know, Western um, investment improved the lives, even though them wages were so low. Um, compared to us, it was an improvement over how imperialism kept those people um, for so long. And now as these wages are rising in China, every bit of dollar they make, and any anti-imperialist, any social democrat in the global south that improves the material conditions is taking dollars and money right out of the hands of the enemy. That's right. yeah. And that's why we support the Syria, and that's why we support Iran, and we support any and every um, oppressed people coming up and taking political, political and economic power of poor black and brown people is anti-imperialism. And we, right. we, can, see it, we can see it right here. Um, we can see it right here. I mean, how are you going to say some stuff like see, Sheepdog Sanders that Biden is your friend <laughs> when I'm working on the line next to somebody who was pushed in absolute poverty, had to flee their country, had people dying along the border, and, li- and then living in the shadows, afraid of the cops because of this man's policy? That is not my friend. Mm-hmm. Biden is an enemy of the people. That's and anybody right. going to get up and support yeah. him yeah. is also the enemy of the people. Uh, so I just want to put in, um, ant- we need an anti-imperialist America. Yes. That's all yeah. I'm- <laughs> Absolutely. Just a quick comment, that's all. Um, it appears, as, as, as you say, that technology leads to the uh, next crisis. So when we reach at least, I don't know, over 50% automation, is that the revolution right there? Think about that. Well, not if we don't control it. Yeah. Yeah. All right.